Good morning. Welcome. I'm James Thurston. Uh, I'm with an organization called G3ICT, the Global Initiative for Inclusive ICTs. Welcome to this workshop. Uh, I'm really excited that we, we have all of you here. We've got a, a great group of speakers. We're going to be talking about bridging the gap and looking at, at issues of inclusion for different kinds of communities uh, in the smart cities that we're creating around the world. So I think it's an incredibly important topic um, because as we, uh, we all know, uh, that cities are really, really leading the digital transformation that we're seeing around the world. But what are the implications for different communities in those cities, for people with disabilities, for women, uh, for older persons? What does all this use of technology and this use of data, um, how does it impact those communities? Uh, and what is their role in, in really influencing the, the exciting digital transformation that we're, that we're seeing around the world in cities? Just by a brief introduction to, to the work that we're doing, which is uh, related to this topic of digital in, of, of inclusion in smart cities, G3ICT is an international nonprofit organization. We were created uh, about 13 years ago with support of the United Nations. And we were created specifically to, to focus on this issue of digital inclusion of people with disabilities around the world. Uh, because I, uh, uh, I think the UN system and, and countries around the world realize that uh, while this transformation is exciting um, and technology can be a real enabler of rights of people, uh, including people with disabilities, we have to really focus on making sure that the benefits accrue to, to all communities uh, around the world of this digital transformation, including communities and cities. About uh, three years ago, we actually launched an initiative focused specifically on smart cities and the impact of, uh, of technology and data on people with disabilities in smart cities. Uh, we started that initiative by doing a global study. We, we did focus groups in smart cities around the world. We surveyed experts, uh, more than 250 experts around the world. And we, what we found is that today, smart cities are actually making the digital divide worse, not better, for people with disabilities. Um, that the, the exciting smart solutions and, and, and technology assets that are being deployed by cities around the world are actually not necessarily working for people with disabilities. Uh, those, some of the, those assets, those smart solutions may not be accessible. Uh, you can design any kind of technology, any smart solution to be accessible, to be usable by a person with, with the broad range of abilities and disabilities. So blind people, people with mobility disabilities, um, but you have to sort of design that in from the outset and be thinking about your community as inclusive of, of all people, including people with disabilities. Uh, but we've got some real challenges in, in doing that, uh, at least today, and, and we're working with, with cities, with governments, with, with uh, industry, corporate partners, and civil society to really think more holistically about, about cities as as home to all kinds of communities, including people with disabilities and older persons. And that, that's the work that we do that's a part of this, this broader discussion that we're gonna have today about bridging the gap. Um, I, I'm really excited about the, the group of experts that we're gonna be hearing from. Um, the, the format will be, there'll be a couple keynote presentations uh, first, we'll take a break, and then we've got a, a really interesting group of, of five panelists that'll have a panel discussion after the short break. To get started, I would like to invite up uh, Catherine D'Ignazio. She's a, a scholar, artist, designer, and I love this, hacker mama. She has a, a, an upcoming book uh, coming from MIT Press called Data Feminism um, that looks at a feminist approach to data science and the implications for, for gender. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite Catherine up to Great. give our first keynote. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Can everybody hear me OK? For how many people is English your first language? Not very many. OK. I, I'm going to try to speak so that uh, it's uh, slow and clear, because I'm familiar with trying to decode things in foreign languages. Um, so I really appreciate uh, the invitation to speak here. Um, it's truly an honor to be here and have the opportunity to meet the other panelists on this panel. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so today, I want to speak to you about how future cities might be feminist cities. 
Um, and so I was already introduced, but I'm a newly an assistant professor of urban science at MIT in urban studies and planning. And I'm going to be launching a lab called the Data Plus Feminism Lab. So I want to lead our time with a quote by someone whose work I've recently been reading, Dr. Georgia Nesty. And she has this great paper about mainstreaming gender equality in smart cities. And for me, at least, as something of a newcomer to the space, there's, it's a very comprehensive vision for how gender equality is not just like part of this side conversation about diversity and inclusion, but it's actually part of the mainstream approach that we take with smart cities. Um, and so she says, basically, the debate about gender in smart cities remains definitely underdeveloped. Um, and to this, we might also add not just gender, but also race, age, ability, all of these things in relationship to smart cities remain underdeveloped. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the question here is, um, who gets to define and design the future and for whom? And so a lot of times what ends up happening and it's not necessarily by intention, there's not an evil plan, but what ends up happening is that we center men's futures. And so why? Why is that? Why is it that our cities and our smart cities are not just inclusive by default? Um, and here I want to introduce, um, oops, sorry. Um, so here I want to introduce the idea called the privilege hazard. Uh, this comes out of a book that I've recently written with Lauren Klein that I'm going to talk about in just a second. Um, but the privilege hazard is what happens when a small and non-representative group controls society's institutions. So what you see here um, is an image of members of the US Senate. And you can tell from their faces that the US Senate is very white. You can tell that they are mostly men. You can tell that they are older, and you may or may not be able to tell that they are richer than the average US citizen. So it's, this is not necessarily a problem at the level of a single congressperson. But then once you put them all together, heading a powerful institution that makes policy for the entire country, then they have a significant amount of ignorance about the life experiences of many, many US citizens and residents. So we'll come back to that question of like who gets to define the future and for whom? Um, and it's also not just along the lines of gender, right? It's also along the lines of class, because like those, those folks in the US Senate, they're not just um, uh, only that they're men, right? They're also richer men. They're also older men. Um, and so we when we really drill down at like who's controlling, at least in the US context, many of the institutions, when we design for the future, often what we center is the experiences of a very small subset of the population. So we're looking at elite, white, cisgender, heterosexual, abled, middle-aged men. So it's really narrow, <laughs> right? It's really narrow that a very small group of people sort of stands in for the default body or the default person for whom we are designing cities or designing technologies. Um, and again, I wanted to say that this is not part of a nefarious plan. It's not that these people are evil. It's just that what happens when you have the ignorance of not having the life experience. Life experience is a kind of empirical data. It's lived empirical data that we have to use in a design process. And so if we're conscious about uh, sort of interrupting that dynamic, we have to take it very seriously. OK. Um, so this thing, this is, this is not my idea. Like uh, this thing that elite men are this sort of default body that we design for, this shows up everywhere. So this shows up in pants pockets. So if you check women's pants pockets, they're notably smaller than men's. There's been a study about this. <laughs> uh, this shows up in heart disease. So that a doctor actually had to write a book, Women Are Not Small Men, <laughs> to counteract this idea. We can't just generalize results from male-based studies to women. Um, and it shows up in uh, crash test dummies, which has been pointed out by the author Caroline Criodo Perez in her excellent book called Invisible Women. Um, and so 
you know, it's been widely cited that crash test dummies because cars were only being tested on male bodies, not on smaller, shorter female bodies, um, that women actually have a 47% higher chance of injury in cars because we've been overlooking the fact that women have different bodies for so long. So these are these downstream effects of this privilege hazard. They, they happen as a result, not an intentional result, but they happen nonetheless, and we have to figure out how to counteract them. Um, and so just as it's true that the patriarchy shows up in pants, <laughs> right? The patriarchy shows up in urban spaces. It also shows up in our databases and in our automated systems. And so in that same book, Invisible Women, uh, Caroline Criotto Perez says, when planners fail to account for gender, public spaces become male by default. And so I agree with that. Um, and then I would add to that that when data scientists fail to account for gender, then our digital and our informational spaces become men's spaces as well. This is the default. This is what kind of gets baked in there by default unless we're actually paying attention. Um, and so this is at least for me what I see as one of the central dangers in front of us for smart cities. So that they are cities that end up benefiting the elite white men and basically everyone else outside that little kind of center circle from the diagram, uh, not that many of the rest of us. Um, and so this is the place where feminism actually becomes really useful. So what are we talking about? when we're talking about feminism. Um, so for the fa past three years, Lauren Klein and I have been working on a book called Data Feminism. And it's about to come out in March 2020 from MIT Press. So we wrote the book precisely because of these gender and racial inequities that we are seeing and that many other people are seeing and starting to point out right now that we see emerging in data science, in AI, and in our smart cities. So what the book does is we look across um, 40 years of feminist theory, in particular that, that theory that comes from design domains that's trying to look towards applied things, um, and we try to answer the question, what would a feminist approach to data science look like? Uh, we create seven principles of data feminism, and then each chapter is about that principle. But so maybe we've gotten a little bit ahead of ourselves. Um, so what are we talking about when we're talking about feminism? It's, it's worth sort of pausing to reflect on that word. Um, and a starting point for feminism, feminism starts with the idea that gender and race inequality is real. We don't have to prove it. <laughs> it's real. There's lots of data that shows it's real. Uh, it's historic. We don't just uh, you know, forget history. It's ongoing. And it's worth dismantling. It's worth interrupting, and it's worth challenging. So that's the starting point for feminism. And so if we acknowledge that inequality is real and it's ongoing, then if we just ignore the fact that it's there, what we're actually doing is we're upholding, upholding an unjust system. But there are many feminisms. And so I think it's helpful to be really precise about which definition of feminism that we're talking about. Um, so the definition of feminism that we use in the book comes from black feminists in the US context. And they define feminism as not only being about women and about gender, but about power. Who has power and who doesn't have power. Um, and so the brilliance of these women of color scholars and writers and activists was to show how racism and sexism and ableism and all these other forces intersect and they combine to oppress people. And so intersectional feminism is the idea that we can't only challenge male supremacy without challenging white supremacy, without challenging ableism, without challenging colonialism. So when we say feminism, this is the definition that we are mobilizing. Um, so what does this mean for smart cities? Um, so as I see it, I think there are three implications of data feminism for thinking about smart and inclusive cities. And I'll go through these one by one and just give you some very brief kind of like starting points uh, for thinking about these. So first, and th this is probably the most important thing, um, we don't fix a problem by pretending like it doesn't exist. <laughs> That's not how you fix it, right? We can't just ignore gender and imagine that this is all going to work out. 
the same with race and so on. Um, so gender equality in smart cities is not going to happen without concerted efforts on the parts of men and women and non-binary people. So it just this means acknowledging again that gender inequality is real, it's historic, it's ongoing, and it's worth dismantling. Um, and we really need men to work on this um, and to believe this. So as a group, they hold lots of power. They have the power to change many of these institutions. And so we need them at the table. So here I just wanted to point out two references um, that I've been really appreciating in this area. The work by Dr. Nesti that I talked about and also by one of our panelists, Ines Sanchez de Madariaga, um, which I think we're going to learn more about today. Um, and basically what this means is thinking about how do we disaggregate gender data doing gender-based studies of places, of mobility, and then centering gender in all matters um, as a lens of analysis. Um, and so I, I think we're going to be learning more about that. OK, so that's one thing. So, but then taking gender as a lens of analysis, collecting sex and gender disaggregated data, all of these things are a great step. But then the work doesn't stop there. Um, so we also need to think about public engagement, and innovation processes that center the experiences of women, trans people, and non-binary people. Um, because again, we inherit this privilege hazard, right? And this means that the people who are at the leadership positions of our institutions, they're going to miss a lot. They collectively have a lot of ignorance about the life experiences of these groups. Um, and so that's what we need to try to capture through innovation processes that center women, trans, and non-binary folks. And truly centering women in innovation can look really different, profoundly different in content and in form than what our current practices look like. Um, and I really wanted to show you all a video, because one of the things I've been doing recently is running feminist hackathons, particularly on health topics. Um, so we've recently run a hackathon at the MIT Media Lab for over 250 people, and it was called the Make the Breast Pump Not Suck uh, Hackathon. How many people know what a breast pump is? Okay, hey, that's not bad. I didn't know what a breast pump was until I was 31 and like eight months pregnant. <laughs> um, and so, so the, the hackathon itself wasn't only about breast pumps, but it was about breastfeeding, it was about prenatal and postpartum health, and it was about how do we design both products and healthcare systems and policies that really put the needs of women and families and babies at the center. Because right now, this, is very, this was very US focused, but right now I can tell you they are definitely not at the center. Um, OK. Um, and so I, I, the video didn't translate here, but I want to just point out, you can go see the video. I think it gives some of the flavor for what a feminist hackathon looks like and could be. Um, and I just want to say it was like this very joyful, what I thought of as a temporary utopia, a place where women and, family and families and babies could come together to dream up new futures together in an environment that was fully supportive and embraced the birthing and the breastfeeding bodies. Whereas often in public spaces, when you're pregnant, breastfeeding, we have babies, you're often meant to feel how you are not welcome. You go off in separate spaces, or you don't have a space, or you pump on a bathroom floor. And so think about like what are those spaces, those innovation spaces that can both model the process of inclusion and also enact collaborative dreaming about the future. Uh, and this is our next hackathon. This is a menstruation hackathon, and it's titled, There Will Be Blood, because there will be blood. And we should start thinking about it and designing for it and thinking about how to be more inclusive in terms of menstruation. There's a lot of work going on in the menstrual equity space as well. OK. OK, so the final implication of data feminism for smart cities is some really concentrated thinking on how we can scale up data literacy and digital participation for women and for all marginalized groups in the city. Um, despite the fact that computer science, again, at least in the US context, has shown that is really what Lauren and I call a man factory, um, which means that it's really good at producing men. And so if you look at this graphic, this shows that our, our closest point we've come in the US to gender parity in terms of CS graduates was in 1984. And it's gotten worse and worse since then. So it kind of women came into the field, and then women are, are sort of exiting the field and the major. Um, 
And in the book, we talk about some of these characteristics of the man factory. Um, so what, what, what makes this field a man factory? Um, and there's a couple of things. Things like elite men are always leading things. Um, there are no models for other kind of bodies, people, et cetera. Um, CS and data are often taught as being very abstract and technical, and certainly that's one of their strengths, is abstraction. Um, but they're taught as being removed from social context and from applied areas of how they might actually be using data and technology for social good. That's not how they're taught, and for the most part. And I don't want to, there's actually lots of good models, so this is generalization. Um, and then the measure of success is individual mastery rather than collaborative shared work across domains and different types of expertise. Um, so how might we teach data and computer science differently? How might we help communities do things like use open data for their work, as well as scale civic groups' ability to meaningfully participate in technology decision making? A lot of times when um, <laughs> folks in, in planning and in technology have said to me like, oh, people like the citizens, general people are just not interested in smart cities. Like we can't get them to come to meetings. Um, but you know what? That's like not an equal conversation when you're like, what do you think of smart cities? The average person is not going to have this super informed opinion on that topic, just as these folks wouldn't have an informed opinion on like childcare or something like that. Um, so this is a space where I think there's so much room for creativity and for community engagement and thinking about how we scale up that data literacy and that ability to have a kind of like informed decision making process about technology. Um, and so some small scale models to look at um, are things like Data Basic, which is here on the left. Um, so this is a platform that I designed with Rahul Bargov, who's at the MIT Media Lab. Um, and using it, we teach data science concepts to newcomers in a fun, arts-based way that prompts newcomers to ground things in their social context, that values the experience that they come to the table with and doesn't ask them to set aside that in terms of for, for sort of abstraction. Um, and then on the right uh, is, is a project that we talk about in the book, an educational project called Local Lotto. Um, and in this project, educators taught data science to high school students by having them do a mixed, method, mi mixed methods research project in their neighborhood about the lottery. So while the students were learning about probability and GIS and spatial data analysis, they were also interviewing neighborhood residents about why they bought lottery tickets, interviewing people that sold lottery tickets, they were making maps, and it was all to try to answer the question, is the lottery good or bad for my neighborhood? Which is to say it's, it's teaching skills, but teaching them as a reason of answering really important and urgent questions that have to do with social good and social justice for their neighborhoods where they live. So these are really small projects, but I think they represent a fundamentally different approach to literacy and learning about data that has a much broader civic application than sort of the man factory approaches. Uh, and then I just want to do a quick shout out to a great local program called Technovation Girls Catalonia. Uh, where I'm going to be speaking on Thursday to girls who are hacking and doing STEM projects to improve their local communities. Okay, um, so here they are again. Three implications of data feminism for smart cities. Um, gender engaged, not quote unquote gender blind, where we just ignore, ignore the issue. Um, innovation and planning processes that center women, trans, and non binary people. And then finally, boosting data literacy and digital participation. Um, so, in closing, I just want to advance an idea which I do not think is in any way radical which is that feminist futures are everyone futures. So they're for cis and trans women. They're for gender nonconforming people. Feminist futures are for men to learn how to undo the patriarchy, because we literally cannot do it without men at the table. Um, and Bell, as Bell Hooks said 20 years ago, feminism is for everybody. So she has a, a great book by that title. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Catherine, why don't you just stay, stay oh, here stay, for a stay. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much for, for shining a light on the, the, the privilege hazard and the, the implications on policy and programs that are so instrumental in our 
our day-to-day -day lives and really touching on what I think are some, some key pillars of smart cities, data, innovation, public or, or community engagement, um, uh, a fantastic way of, of expanding our, the way that we look at those pillars in cities. I think we, we have time for, for maybe a, a question. Uh, if anyone has a question, there's some microphones here. There's a microphone if you want to just step to the microphone. Thanks for a brilliant presentation. Thank you. Um, while you're talking about the digital literacy and the hackathons and stuff like that, what are we doing for the mindset changes? Yeah. The parents, how they discriminate between a girl and a mm. uh, boy. Yeah. So how do you look at uh, parental attitudes? And then, in, of course, in the society, we, we do look at uh, college and other uh, curriculum. But sure. parental attitude, would you like to throw some light? Sure. Yeah, I mean, and at least from my part, that's like that's not necessarily where my work goes because it remains mostly in the public domain. But it's a very, it's very real, um, and it exists across cultures and contexts, and um, profoundly shapes. You know, a lot of times when we're talking about sort of pipeline issues in STEM or girls in math or things like this, so much of this has to do with expectations of parents and gender roles that parents sort of place on uh, their girls and thinking about what is open for them, what is possible for them. I just learned about a family actually where they had to make a decision about whether to send the boy or the girl to the elite college and they sent the boy. <laughs> and so, you know, things like this. So, um, yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say is that those of us who are kind of more public facing, uh, teachers, planners, administrators, thinking about ways that we can try to interrupt that dynamic, which they're not necessarily telling parents you're doing it wrong, because no parent will hear that, <laughs> right? Um, but thinking about ways, how do, our, how do our programs, how do our spaces, how do the opportunities that we give interrupt that and elevate that and uh, help the girls be sort of hero heroines in some level, like give them cred that might actually contradict parental expectations or something like this. So, thank you. Right. Catherine, th thank you very much again. Uh, and I think you'll be here during the break as, as well. Sure, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great. So, um, next up, our, our next speaker will be Federico Batista Poitier. Uh, Federico has seven years of experience in development and disability inclusion, working as a strategic advisor and presenter on inclusive development and human rights. His professional and educational experience has literally taken him uh, around the world, having worked or, or studied in six regions, including Africa, Europe, Asia, North and South America, and the Middle East. Federico? Is this on? Okay. Can everybody hear me? So uh, I want to thank the, the last presenter. Uh, mine is going to be a little bit more, not as, as beautiful as the last presentation, but I really liked um, that part of the, the privilege hazard which I think a lot of the time it goes into um, the, the aspect of this digital divide that we, we talk about uh, quite often. I just wanted to ask, oh, there it is, I see it, big clicker. Um, so yeah, uh, I've just being able to uh, interact with so many different cultures and, and different people has really kind of led me in this journey of what do we think about inclusion. Uh, and um, having this background, uh, with uh, my mother who has a disability and has worked with persons with disabilities for uh, many years, and uh, my great friend and, and my boss that can't be here today, uh, which uh, his name is Dr. Victor Pineda, uh, we've just uh, really started trying to bring people uh, into a discussion, both people who are already involved in the discussion, like this uh, elite white man that uh, we said, and also people who are not uh, traditionally involved in the discussion, which, uh, if we look at a, a lot of figures, uh, we have about 25% of the global population, which represents persons with disabilities and older persons, uh, that are uh, often or uh, most often uh, excluded from a lot of development uh, projects, cultural initiatives, uh, education, uh, employment. And we really need to ask ourselves, uh, not only ask ourselves, uh, but open up discussions to figure out where are the opportunities uh, for inclusion, and where can we merge these, this divide and create a bridge uh, to 
unite our efforts because we all know that diversity, everybody's talking about diversity and inclusion as a strategic uh, priority, but are we really sign signaling diversity and inclusion within our own efforts and initiatives? Uh, so I'll be talking through a report that we had developed um, uh, and it will provide a framing, but you can also think of it outside of the space of the actual study. Uh, so the, the first thing I wanted to ask everyone, um, and uh, I would love if three people could just stand up and tell me their first thoughts. Uh, so when you hear the word uh, innovation, okay, can I have somebody, what's the first thing you think about when you hear innovation? Really quick, first jump up. Huh? Smart education, okay, we have smart education. So I'm gonna go from there. Uh, when you hear smart cities, what's the first thing that you think about? ICT. ICT, okay. Smart cities, we have ICT, smart education. All right, and then the last aspect, okay, when you think of technology, what's the first thing that comes up to your head? Huh? Innovation, okay, we have innovation, technology, smart education, and the last one was? This with smart cities, you said ICT, okay. So uh, one question that, um, as I was thinking about this session, um, was you know, how, how are we thinking about innovation? How are we thinking about smart cities? Uh, how are we thinking about digital technology? So interestingly enough, when I, I did the searches for uh, smart cities, uh, innovation, uh, technology, I didn't find a lot of pictures of people, all right? I found a lot of pictures similar to the one on the left, and in case the lighting's not so good or you can't see so well, uh, it's a, a landscape, of, a city landscape, could be something like New York, with lots of lights, and, uh, looking really fast-paced, right? But on the, on the, the left-hand side of the screen, uh, I have a photo uh, that was taken last week. Um, I was in Durban last week for the United Cities and Local Governments uh, session. Um, and this was really looking at the future of urbanism and all the challenges that it's going to take. Um, and we had an opportunity to talk about where inclusion and accessibility fits in there. So for me, uh, innovation, right, is people, right? Innovation is having a group of people in a room being able to talk together. Uh, and and in, through that innovation, you learn a lot of things. Because when you see this photo, uh, you don't know Im immediately all the dimensions that are behind the people in the photo, right? We have mothers, we have fathers, we have people with disabilities in the photo, we have people over 60 in the photo, we have people working in cities, we have people who are working with, directly with technology, we have people who are just wanting to grow together and build something, but they all agree that the mechanisms for them to dialogue are not always as inclusive as they could be. So that's the challenge that I really want people to think about coming out through the, the end of this session, is how do we move from thinking uh, that smart cities are ICT? How can we move to thinking about ICT connect, connecting us to the, the real smart cities, which are the people? So that's the, the whole aspect of, of uh, the technology that we need to move forward with. And so I'm going to talk about a little bit of the, the digital report um, that we launched. We're going to launch at the end of this week. Um, uh, I have a great colleague, James, here, who was um, also fed into the report. And I, I'm excited that we can finally share it, because I'm always discussing it, but um, it's not online. But it will be available on Thursday. The question that came from the report is um, how, to, how and to what extent are development agencies addressing digital and inclusion and accessibility in their work, right? So you can actually change uh, a lot of development agencies and put it in with companies, put it in with uh, cities, um, and really thinking about that question. Uh, and we had some surprising results, and uh, we know and we're here because we know the opportunities that are available for uh, digital technology to include uh, a large member of the population. And we also know that a lot of the, the mainstream technologies that we use now actually started off in, as, as accessibility. So if you think about this uh, and all that we know now and why we are here, 
Uh, if somebody could give me maybe a percentage or a, uh, an answer um, to this question, okay? Would anybody want to take a, a stab? You can say a percentage, or you can say, I think they're a lot, or I think they're not doing anything. Would anybody like to? 10%, okay, two more, we have a 10%. Five, okay, we have a 5%, wow. 5% <laughs> one more. Eight, okay, we have eight, five, and 10%. Very good, all right, I'll, I'll go into it as we move a little bit further. All right, so uh, in the study, we were able to um, survey about uh, 20 practitioners from different development agencies that included the African uh, Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank. We also had other agencies like UNICEF uh, that were involved in the study. Um, so uh, one of the first chapters really goes into uh, digital accessibility is not seen as a priority. So many of you, I think, stated this by having this 5, 8, 10%. Um, that was one of the big things that came out, um, that even though we know that uh, accessible technology ends up benefiting the broader part of the, part of the population, not only persons with disabilities and older persons. Uh, for, for the moment, it's still not a priority, right? Uh, so if you look at the, the, the respondents, um, a key issue stated uh, the, the lack of awareness uh, that was actually in the organization. So it, it uh, stemmed from different aspects. It could be a lack of awareness of, of the standards, actually a lack of awareness of the, the actual tools. But there was a general lack of awareness internally um, and not a stating of a mechanism to combat that lack of awareness. Uh, and so the, um, the respondents also in this terms of the lack of awareness uh, did mention that they do believe that these uh, digital accessibility standards should be in the, uh, across the, the structures, but a majority of them uh, didn't have this as a pillar. Uh, so inclusion was not a pillar in terms of their digital development efforts. So you're probably asking yourself why, you know, if we know that inclusion is good, if we know that uh, by making things accessible, uh, they are accessible from the start to a wide range of, uh, of the population and can also lead into innovations like speech to text that everybody uses now. Uh, why aren't we doing this, right? And we looked into uh, another aspect in terms of guidelines for uh, digital accessibility. And uh, a lot, the, the majority of the respondents also mentioned the fact that the, if there aren't any guidelines or frameworks, uh, although they know the benefits are there, no one will ever find the budget, right? But as soon as those guidelines and those frameworks are in place, the budget suddenly has to be assessed, right? And people will find the budget. So there is an importance to having a framework uh, across the system structure because what is a priority uh, and what is mandated will in the end become what's part of the financing. But when it is something optional, uh, right, that person becomes an option, right? And the, the idea is that if we're looking at innovation as the, the person and rather than the technology, right, then the financing and the, the priority should be the person in the end, not the technology. So these frameworks were an important aspect um, to, that, uh, to ensuring that these uh, um, efforts in digital development do not leave anybody behind. But the respondents also mentioned that although the frameworks exist, they weren't integrated into the actual strategy. Uh, another aspect that was really key and something um, that came out a lot uh, also in the, the study that we had done with G3ICT in terms of the Smart Cities for All toolkit uh, was also the knowledge base on digital, digital accessibility is needed. So this also goes back into the, the lack of awareness uh, that most of the, uh, the experts and respondents uh, for the interview noted was the fact that they, they didn't have an adequate un, um, knowledge base within their organization or within their partners uh, that could help them build capacity, 
right? And, and so this is the, the, one of the aspects that we have to look in terms of uh, the use of partnerships, right? So the, the agencies um, thinking uh, that the, uh, the homework is for them, right? Uh, but maybe, you know, like when I was young, uh, I called my friend across the street and I said, Roberto, I don't know how to do this, right? Uh, and that was me being very open to the fact that I didn't know how to do something. And that was something also the, the development agencies uh, said they lacked in really uh, the partnerships and engaging in types of partnerships that could provide a good knowledge base. Um, and uh, understanding what tools are available. So it's really simple to create a strategy. Um, and so you, you can say that I, I want to include women or I want to include uh, older, older persons. Uh, but at the end, uh, that strategy needs to be implemented, and we need to know the mechanisms and the tools. So uh, that was a, a big part of uh, the gap in terms of developing these solutions, is that uh, we want to know the tools. And it's actually what cities mentioned uh, in the, their gap in including uh, persons with disabilities and older persons, is a lack of tools to actually implement inclusive solutions. And uh, the last aspect is uh, the, the coordination among stakeholders. Uh, so uh, one aspect uh, in the, the coordination is internally, externally, uh, and externally. Um, and internally, in terms of the, if there is a, a mechanism internally that is uh, focused on inclusion, it doesn't go cross-cutting, right? It's a, an inclusion department that works on inclusion in a silo, right? But you may have an urban development department or you may have a uh, education department, which those, those departments do not communicate with each other. So how do you structure this and create better communication internally and also externally? How do you coordinate uh, with, um, with other stakeholders, in, in the case of development agencies, with countries, so that the, the, what's being mandated from the country also meets uh, inclusion and um, ensures that, that we're not developing a solution that 10 years down the line uh, we figure out has left 25% uh, of the population out of the equation. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, there's four things up here. It's not so simple. Um, but kind of thinking of a, a checklist uh, in terms of inclusive digital development. So one of the, in my opinion also, the most important things is framing the co-benefits, okay? The, the co-benefits of, of accessibility, um, which are not only in terms of uh, inclusion of, of people into the space, but also in terms of economic prosperity. Uh, you, if you leave a portion of the population uh, out of the, the workforce, if you leave a portion of the population out of the education, a lot of your budget goes into then supporting the exclusion that has been created. So we need to look at the co-benefits into that space uh, and, and showing that, one, uh, we have uh, people who want to, to participate, who want to exercise their potential, um, but the mechanisms, the platform for that inclusion is not in place. Where in, in the first, uh, we had the, the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, that excluded people. And now the same is happening in the digital infrastructure, where you, uh, my colleague earlier mentioned the, the AI bias, which also happens to persons with disabilities, uh, where AI uh, can actually recognize them. And that becomes a, a big danger when we look at artificial intelligence being slowly integrated into the public services that are available in cities. So this is a huge uh, thing that needs to be understood as a co-benefit. The big part I like to say is innovation, innovation, innovation. By bringing a lot of people around the table, you're able to innovate. Uh, and so looking at technology as a mechanism and not the solution, okay? The solution is happening with the people. That mechanism can be technology. So if you have a mother who has, in, in the, the Global South, where, where culturally the, the caretaker is taking that model, if you create a system through technology in which that mother is able to engage in economic, economic prosperity, um, you bring that voice out of the house. The same as uh, a person with a mobility impairment that uh, traditionally can't get to works places. So we can look at technology to bridge the divide that infrastructure still has in place uh, for a much lower cost. Uh, another aspect is utilizing the, the guidelines and existing policies 
uh, as frameworks. So actually putting uh, guidelines in which the, the projects and safeguards will, uh, will also uh, require the uh, accessible, um, the de development, digital development projects are procuring accessible technology and also uh, signaling uh, that the beneficiaries are for all. Um, and a, a key part uh, which I want to mention from the study when uh, you uh, said 5, 8, 10%. Um, actually, out of the 1,200 active uh, digital development projects which we surveyed, only 4% of them mentioned persons with disabilities as beneficia beneficiaries. So you imagine 4%. And knowing that the, the respondents also said, if there isn't this mandate in place, that it won't happen. So we know that we're leaving people behind. 96% of these active digital opportunities that are growing in cities will leave people behind. And it can be as simple as not putting it in the document that first starts at the table. Uh, another aspect that we should be thinking about is developing technical knowledge and capabilities for outcomes. So this can be as simple as devoting, I say simple, but um, this can be uh, something as strategic as having a specific person to coordinate across the different agencies. Uh, on accessibility, which has been a key factor um, in terms of companies like Microsoft or cities like um, Sao Paulo. By having a focal point that goes across the different agencies, you then have a capacity to, to monitor your programs and ensure that from the start that they're engaged. Uh, and also creating communities of practice. So this is the biggest thing that we hear from cities from, from companies, uh, from also uh, civil society members, is that we need uh, communities that can engage together around issues, uh, develop uh, tools, share those best practices. Uh, so we want to learn from each other. And from that, that learning and that dialogue, which is at the heart of innovation, uh, we can then create those tools and actually ensure that uh, we're bringing all voices to the table. And you ask those hard questions. You know, in, when we were in, in Durban the, the last week with these mayors, uh, just by organizing a session that was accessible, some of the mayors came up to uh, the different participants to me after and they said, you know, I'm asking myself why I've never brought a delegation uh, that has a person with disability or somebody over 60 in my, uh, as a part of my delegation. And why am I not having captioning on videos? Uh, why am I not uh, using the accessibility checker that's not available for a lot of, of documents? So why am I not prioritizing that? And why am I putting the barriers in front? And, and why am I saying that this, these budgets aren't there? And a lot of it is the lack of awareness, right? If we, we open up these tools, if we create these communities of practice, there is an awareness raising, and people know that there's tools available, they know there's expertise. Uh, across regions, we're not only looking at uh, places in, in the global north like the U.S., you have places uh, uh, like Banyarasim in Indonesia, uh, you have places like uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil, you have places like Rabat in Morocco that are really catalyzing and putting these issues on the table. And it's really, we need to create an inclusive development for all. So I, I'm running out of time, so I just wanted to leave some, some last aspects We've uh, been working a lot uh, with cities and other stakeholders um, around these key principles of, of development. Uh, I'll let you take a picture so I don't uh, take up more time. Um, but these, uh, on top of that checklist, should be kind of those key principles. And this can be across a city, this can be across a company, this can also be across your own nonprofit organization that should be signaling inclusion from the start. Thank you. Thank you. Your shoe's untied, yes. I'm going to tie my shoe over. Th thank you, Federico. Um, I, I think it's, uh, first of all, congratulations on the report that's going to be coming out soon. And, and, and that, that data point that just 4% of, of the hundreds of development projects that you analyze um, that are really defining how, uh, what cities look like, what urban areas look like around the world, just 4% have some focus on, on disability is is a real opportunity, uh, I think. So congratulations on that work um, in getting that out to the public. I think we have time for one question for Federico before we, we take a break. Uh, any, any questions? If not, I, I actually have, is there, do you see a? Uh, oh, there's one there. If you wanna just go to the microphone right behind you. 
I can't see anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about, women? what about women? Yeah, I mean, we had our partner really discussing this. I didn't want to reiterate it, but uh, there is a very low percentage. And you imagine if you add these double figures, right? So if you're an older woman, if you're a woman with disability, if you're a woman that's also not from uh, a northern country, those stats go way down, right? And, and so this is a, a big aspect why I also think that we need these kind of spaces, but also that they turn into something afterwards, right? That it's not just a dialogue. Uh, which we talk a lot with the, with the cities, the participation is not bringing people to the table. It's throughout the process, from the inception to the end. We have to have women at the table. We have to have diverse women at the table. You know, black women, uh, mixed race women, women with disabilities, older women, they all have to be there at the table, you know, and, and also the, these mechanisms that are advisories should need to be representative. And I'm a big proponent of data. So if we have the majority of the population that's women, all right, and the 25% the that are older persons and persons with disabilities, if you have this whole room and that doesn't represent these international figures, you're not meeting the point. So. Uh, again, uh, thank you, Federico. Uh, and what we're going to do now is take a, a 10 or 12 minute break, maybe start up at, at 12.40, uh, and then we have a, a, a really great panel that will be diving into some more aspects of, of this bridging the, the gap and, and really making sure that as we're building cities uh, that we're thinking about inclusion. So I, I would invite you to, to take a quick break and meet us back here in about 10 or 12 minutes. Thank you. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're going to, to go into the panel discussion part of the workshop now. And we actually have uh, more panels than what you, what you even see here, I think, uh, which is great. Uh, the title of the panel is Lowering Social and Digital Gaps for More Inclusive Cities. Uh, we've, we've assembled a, a set of experts and leaders from, from different kinds of organizations from different regions of the world, each with a pretty unique and I think important perspective on this, this issue of, of lowering barriers, decreasing gaps uh, when it comes to smart cities. Uh, I'm going to, uh, they're, they're each going to speak for about seven minutes. Um, we'll have each of them speak, and then we've reserved plenty of time at the end, assuming that we all keep to the seven minutes. Plenty of time for some interaction and uh, hopefully for some questions from each of you, uh, some of you, at, at the end of the session. With that, I'm going to let you each introduce your, yourselves uh, because you're, you're, you will be able to do that more expeditiously than I can and, and more accurately. And our First speaker on the panel will be Ms. Inez Sanchez de Madriaga. And could I have my presentation on, or do I? Can I? Uh, I think that's the wrong. Uh... It's, that's mine. That's hers. No. Is. Is, an, is anyone uh, putting the presentations, or do I have to do it from here? Por favor, alguien puede poner la presentación, o la tengo yo que poner desde aquí, porque no veo yo que el ratón funcione. Okay, without presentation then. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Inés Sánchez de Madariaga. I'm an architect and city planner. I'm director of the UNESCO chair on gender at Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. I'm going to to continue and on the first wonderful keynote that we had on gender in smart cities. And uh, I'm going to, to um, talk a little bit on how building cities, planning cities, managing cities, how this has to do with gender. If we can get the presentation, it would be great. Uh, cities uh, have been built uh, or are being planned according to to a set of, um, of techniques and, and models that were built at the turn of the 20th century uh, that take into consideration as, as the norm, as the standard, the realities of, of daily life of men. When we look at those um, uh, techniques, at those tools, at those planning uh, instruments from the standpoint of gender, of how men and women use the city 
can we have the presentation? Are we going to have it or not? Because I will present in different ways if we have it or not. ¿La vamos a tener la presentación o no? No. I didn't. He, he left to make sure it comes out. Right? Okay. Sorry about this. <laughs> so when we look at, at, at cities uh, from the point of view of, uh, of gender, we need to take into account a number of concepts that have been brought by gender studies in the last, I would say, 40 years. Uh, the key concept that gender studies bring that is very relevant for planning cities is the concept of care. Care that relates to all those activities that have to do with the caring of other persons, of the young, of the elderly, of, of people with um, uh, functional, different uh, functional uh, abilities, uh, of the sick, uh, and also with the upkeep of the home. Those are uh, activities and tasks that are uh, done on a daily basis, mostly by women. This is what the statistics tell us. Eurostat, for instance, tells us this. And when we look at the building of cities from this standpoint, uh, the, the way techniques, planning techniques are used, and, and even the meaning uh, and, and the concepts uh, that underlie planning techniques change totally. For instance, what in planning terms are the places for work uh, is very different when we look from the standpoint of caring, because what, caring for people is work. And, uh, and planning has this um, perspective that overemphasizes uh, the needs of, of the economy and doesn't look so much as, as to the needs of, um, of, of, uh, of caring activities in the city. Um, I um, would like to, uh, to mention a very specific um, example that illustrates this, and this relates to transportation. Um, it, this is very particularly relevant because transportation is very easily quantifiable, so you need using data. And, um, and you need to look at data, take into account uh, gender realities, the realities of the daily lives of women, uh, and you know to, to produce data that don't have gender bias, that, that don't have gender omissions. Uh, and um, when you look at transportation data, there are so many gender biases and omissions because uh, the data um, sets the way uh, uh, transportation organizations analyze uh, travel in cities um, um, is biased from the perspective of the normative use that men do. Uh, that is mostly a commuting uh, travel pattern from the home to the workplace and back, and maybe some smaller trips to some uh, leisure activities. But it's not, uh, while uh, the trips that most women do uh, that are precisely related to taking care of persons in the city and the upkeep of the home, women uh, do these um, uh, many more trips uh, in uh, chained links because they go uh, to um, bring kids to school, uh, they, then they go to work, they have to do some errands, they take care of elderly, uh, of elderly relatives, they have to extracurricular activities, all these different things that uh, are needed to do around the city, many times in distant locations. Um, uh, and using dif more different transportation modes uh, transportation data are not really measuring or considering these uh, categories as travel, as travel categories. So I developed this concept of mobility of care uh, 10 years ago for a research I did for the Spanish Ministry of Transportation, which has been published in a number of, uh, of places, uh, to make visible and to quantify all this mobility. Because currently, in most transportation data sets, uh, those trips are hidden under other headings, such as leisure, or, or shopping, or visits, or strolling. Uh, and when you develop this umbrella concept of mobility of care, and you design specific service that ask for uh, and, and allow you to quantify all these trips done for uh, for the upkeep of the home and the caring of people in the city, you are able to make visible and to quantify. And I did this uh, broad estimate that those trips could be uh, in, in, in just in, uh, in figures, as many as the trips done for uh, employment purposes. 
I did this very broad estimate. And then I, I designed together with a PhD student of mine um, a specific survey with the right questions, the detailed questions, and we did the survey for the population between 30 and 45 uh, in the metropolitan area of Madrid. And the result was very, very close to what I had estimated. It's, uh, it's the, the amount of trips done for caring purposes, for the support of daily life, done mostly by women, are almost as many as those trips done for employment purposes. Uh, when you look at those data uh, uh, and you sex disaggregate them, you see that uh, the trips done for employment purposes, more men do more, but the gap, the gender gap is not so big. But when you look at the trips done for caring purposes and you sex disaggregate them, the gender gap is very big. So men do very few care-related trips. This is maybe one of the reasons they are not um, considered in, in the transportation sectors because the transportation sector is highly male-dominated. There are very few women engineers, very few women. It's probably the most male-dominated sector in, throughout governments and public agencies and also in the private sector. Um, uh, and, uh, and so there is a very strong normative outlook of, at travel from, from the male experience. So getting into the picture, this new concept of mobility of care allows to shift positions, to change your perspective, to look uh, better into the realities of transport uh, needs and, and to better respond and define policies that better address the needs of everyone. Because when you look at the needs uh, and the travel realities of, of women that are related to care activities, you are also obviously looking at the realities of, of the young, of the elderly, of those who cannot move autonomously around the city, which are uh, uh, more and more uh, because the sort of cities that we're building is less and less accessible in public transportation modes. So as people l lose the ability to, to drive with age or with any kind of, of physical issue, um, and as uh, loca um, the places where things are done get more and more distant, uh, it's uh, many people who are not able to move autonomously uh, 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 on their own in the city. So it's uh, looking from this perspective allows to better address the needs of everyone in the city, not only of women. So uh, I will finish here. I'm very sorry I cannot show any, any image to illustrate this uh, more easily, but <laughs> sometimes technique is not, it's not up to, to expectations. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for, the, for the remarks, and uh, I apologize that your, your presentation wasn't uh, available. No problem. <laughs> um, uh, and thank you for really, uh, I think, uncovering the, this these hidden categories of mobility and transportation. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, when people think of smart cities, one of the first areas they think mm -hmm. about is transportation. And so getting, yeah. getting to that bias in, that, in those data mm -hmm. sets is critically important. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, we'll, we'll come back for questions for all of the panelists at the very end. Next is Jesus Hernandez Galan from the Fundacion Once. I'm from, anybody can hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, uh, I, let, let me explain what is uh, ONCE Foundation and what is ONCE, because uh, most of you are abroad from Spain and maybe you don't know uh, which, uh, which is our organization. Maybe it's the biggest organization around the world working for people with disability and working from people with, uh, with disability. We are an 80 years old uh, organization. And we, we was uh, created, the ONCE was created in, at the end of the civil, uh, civil war. And um, 30 years ago, ONCE decided to create the ONCE Foundation. ONCE Foundation worked with two main topics, employment and accessibility, uh, to improve the quality of life of people with all kinds of disability in, uh, in Spain, because ONCE is focused on blind and visual impaired people, and ONCE Foundation is working, as I told uh, before, on uh, accessibility and employment, thinking in all kinds of uh, disabilities. I am the, the director of uh, accessibility of uh, Fundacion ONCE. L let me say uh, many, many figures about our organization. Uh, we are working 
in our organization 70,000 uh, people, it's a, a lot of people, and our incomes from, come from the, the lottery. Our incomes and a group of uh, companies to, to, to develop, the, to create jobs for people with disability. And our incomes is around 3,000 million uh, euros per, per year. So for that I told uh, we are one of the biggest organization or maybe the biggest organization working for people with uh, disabilities. Federico, as I work on accessibility, Federico told before, around 25% of the population is uh, disabled or, or is about the accessibility. But I would like to, to play a game with you. Do you, do you would like to play a game with me to demonstrate the accessibility concern of the population? Are you agree with me? May, uh, can you help me to stand up and I start the, the play? May you stand up, please, all, all of you, please? Thank you very much uh, to play with me. And I would like to ask to see the women that uh, was pregnant one or more time in their lives. Please sit, the, sit, sit down. Sit down, please, all the, the women uh, who was pregnant. I saw a man sitting. I, I'm not very agree with that. But uh, please sit all the, or everyone who has broken a leg or an arm and have a, any problem of uh, to, to mobility. Or please sit everybody who puts a trolley or a, with or with a baby or something like uh, like this. Or please sit all the people who visit another country and uh, don't know the language and uh, feel like a uh, cognitive impairment. So. <laughs> Just one, two people stand up. Maybe you don't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, 100% of the population is about the accessibility and how to improve the accessibility. Maybe you move forward my my presentation, please. O igual, Inés, ¿me puedes ayudar tú? Sí. Let me see, there's a... La presentación. Sí, sí, dándole, avanzando. Um, how we improve the accessibility? Um, we, we usually develop agreements with other, other organizations. Voy a necesitar que me lo vea. Ah, the next one, please. Next one. Uh, let me talk uh, about one of the biggest agreements in Spain and maybe uh, abroad uh, about the... Um, to improve the accessibility in Spain. It was an agreement with the Social Services Institute, and we invest around 220 million euros in uh, cities, developing works of accessibility and uh, teaching the engineers and architects who work on the, on the municipalities to improve the accessibility. They have to ask us for, for money uh, through a grant, and uh, they have to send us a project about accessibility. So as they didn't learn about the accessibility in the university, they, has to, or they have to learn accessibility, um, learn by doing, uh, uh, presenting us uh, the, the project of accessibility. So as I told you, we help more than 800 municipalities in Spain improving the accessibility, move, move forward. And uh, we developed another me memorandum of understanding with other corporation, public administration, municipalities. You can see there are many of the organization we have agreements to improve the accessibility. And uh, the other area we work, as uh, I told before, many university, ma many professional finish their, their studies, architecture, engineer, but all kind of studies, and they don't learn about the design, about the design for all. And this is a big problem because they don't develop their, their uh, professional work uh, introducing the accessibility in their project. So for that, we develop this uh, kind of uh, project to introduce the design for all in the university, in the curriculum for all. We are now working in an in a European project, the Erasmus uh, project, working with three 
European University, University of Bologna, University College of London, University of Ronell, and the University of Francisco de Vitoria in Spain to develop the material to teach uh, accessibility in the, the um, uh, studies of architecture and civil engineer. We think this is very important to improve all together working on accessibility. And we develop two um, technical solutions. For example, we develop a solution to, for the sound of traffic lights to switch on and switch off the sound of traffic light because this uh, is it usually is very noisy. This, uh, this sound of traffic lights is, if it is uh, continuous. So we distribute between pe blind people and visually impaired people a remote control to switch on and switch off the sound of traffic lights. lights. But there was a lot of problem with that because uh, for security, uh, sometimes the, uh, the remote, the controls, doesn't uh, work for inhibitors. So we develop a connection between, uh, through Bluetooth to connect and to activate the sound of traffic, uh, traffic -like lights. We develop two uh, orientation uh, guidance uh, system with uh, beacons. Uh, working with uh, Microsoft, this is our, our the, the company are supporting this kind of uh, solution. But I would like to launch a question: Are they all the all the cities thinking about all the necessities of the citizens? I think the the answer is not for the moment. We have to work more in that uh, in that area. And the other thing I would like to to tell about the accessibility. Uh, let's go the the next one is um, the accessibility is not only about the technology. The technology are go not going to solve the accessibility problem. I am very concerned about uh, that because when we talk with many, many mayors, uh, many public administrators, they, they think with an app are going to solve the problem of accessibility. And this is not true. If you live in your building, in your, in your house, and, and you don't have, have a lift, you live in a jail, and any app are going to solve this uh, problem. If there is any step in the, in the pathway, mm -hmm. uh, you can move around uh, individually and autonomous in the, in the city. So for that, it's very important to work together with the technology, but it, uh, uh, too with the physical environment. And uh, mm -hmm. that's uh, all for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I've been uh, privileged to see some of the work that, that Anse does, uh, and it really is some, some amazing and, and innovative, uh, truly innovative work. So I would uh, re recommend that you check out some of their additional activities and programs. Next up will be Suparno Banerjee. He's a vice president at Nokia. Uh, this is, all right, so thank you. And you've heard some tremendous presentations from both policy side, theoretical from earlier ones about why it's important. And I'll give you something from a practitioner's point of view. As Nokia, we are technology, we are a technology company. We connect, we transport information, we make cities work. And the question is how does it intersect with accessibility and inclusion. And I think there's a really fundamentally important piece that it enables and what we do, and I just like share some real life examples. But before I get into it, that platform, it began with a very personal journey. I was been in the smart city space for some time. It was not called smart cities. And that work took me to China. And I was working in the region and we were looking at these new startup cities, the introduction of technology, and then the terrible events in Japan happened, Fukushima and the disaster. And as a company, we were involved in my prior company, we were involved in restoring those communities. And what seems smart 
two weeks before wasn't smart anymore. What was important was how do we restore the lives of these people. These were people living in schools, in community halls. And how did we restore and bring everything back to life? And at that point in time, it drove home to me that when we talk about smart cities, the technology, the projects mean nothing unless they have a purpose. And they solve a bigger social or a deeper social problem. And intricately involved in all of that is inclusion. And so this is a real life project. If you, that diagram is actually, or that picture is from the city of Wroclaw in Poland. And if you look at what does purpose mean, and this is a project we just began, we just announced it last week. And if you see, it has these pillars. It is about technology to take care of the aging population, the elderly, and not even just the elderly, with specific focus on those with mobility challenges. It is about creating a knowledge economy, but again, within that, a specific focus on uh, those that practice the traditional art and craft because that is a dying segment of their population. It's about the intersection of transport and the elderly so that we can take care of it and the environment which affects everybody and children more than others because they're so much more susceptible to these, to these impacts. And so if you look at what Nokia provides, we provide in the technology platform these fundamental pillars. And in the first, we talk about the digitally connected city. And a lot of our work actually is in extending the connectivity to parts of the city that do not have maybe what's called in the Western world as the inner cities, or those where connectivity has not been provided, because without that, it's not just the people there, but future generations probably are left out of mainstream economics, new kinds of jobs, etc. So a lot of our work is in building community broadband projects or those projects that extend the reach of government and government services to these communities that do not have it today. And we get into public-private partnerships over long periods of time. So a lot of the work that we've done is around monet, quote unquote, monetization, whether it comes from the government as a grant, whether there's some other services that can be put on top, it's a very, very fundamentally important part of what we do. And if I look at that stack, which is about connect, collect, comprehend, and then control to be able to make uh, decisions, that intelligence bit is really important because a lot of this conversation was about inclusion and a fundamental element in that is the ability to identify who is excluded today so that you know what services to provide to bring them into the net. And the tools we provide allow for that analytic to take place to be able to identify those who are on the wrong side of that divide. Could be a digital divide, could be an economic divide, could be an age divide, could be a mobility divide, could be a gender divide. The city gets to make the choices, but those choice points are now available through those analytics and then the operations that allows for that seamless delivery of service. And so just some examples of some projects that we do. Several projects in that connected care we talked about where we are extending this reach either at a national scale or at a local scale to bring communities and bring them connected so that the next generation of services can be provided. We talked about this platform with a purpose which makes its way or felt in this connected care model, which is around provision of services at home, services in daycare center, services at the central facility, wearable so that the traffic light, as you example, the use case that we see is, I've seen that in countless cities, a person comes to a traffic light, wants to cross, that is time for only 30 seconds, and this person may not, that may not be enough time for them to cross that road. What about making it so that the traffic signal is intelligent enough to extend the time to 45 seconds or a minute, knowing who that person is? 
right? And then obviously, a lot of work, it's not just the technology solution, but it's everything else that goes around it. And I'll leave you with this thought, and I was talking to James about, in my view, and as you see walk around here, there's a lot of similarity, and we shouldn't let it be so, between smart cities and Hollywood movies. You know, in many Hollywood movies, we've had just special effects take over, but we've lost the soul. We've lost the story. And oftentimes, we think of smart cities as purely just throwing technology, but it's about purpose. It's about the outcome for the citizen, because without the city and without the outcome, these technologies mean nothing. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And, and I think for, uh, for the, the, the last comment about, or analogy, uh, about really sort of keeping honest about the purpose of these technologies and these smart solutions and the uses of data, which is uh, around the people, the communities in the cities, uh, and making sure that they're benef benefiting from them. Thank you very much. So next up will be Dr. Shalini Rajneesh from the Tumakuru Smart City. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, very good afternoon. And a special namaskara from India. This is our cultural inclusivity icon, which means that the soul within me bows to the soul within you, which means there is no difference between you and me. And therefore, we are all inclusive. And this is centuries-old phenomena. I represent uh, uh, the planning department of Government of Karnataka, and I head one of the smart cities of uh, India, which have been uh, selected to be developed over a period of five years. As you see in the presentation, uh, Tumkuru smart city is very close to Bangalore. Bangalore is known as the Silicon uh, Valley of India. And it's just an hour away. And it's, uh, uh, the project involves about $19 million of investment over a period of five years. And majority of it goes into just 10% of the area. Because what we want to do is a showcase of the best of facilities of a smart city and then further uh, extend it to the rest of the city. But I believe uh, that more than the infrastructure, it is the smart people who make the city smart. And I would like to share in this presentation as to what are the initiatives taken by the smart city to make our people smart. Before that, just a flowery uh, tribute. The name Tumkuru comes from a local flower, uh, which is called Thumbe, and I will not spell the botanical name. Um, we started with the phenomena of involving the citizens at the planning stage itself. So out of 350,000 people, I have 175,000 people included in the planning process and saying, yes, this is my dream. This is what I want you to do. And as uh, we had the presenter saying, 5% or 4% are inclusive from the public uh, department side. We had to go to their houses and we ensured that at least one person in every family talks it out and tells us what they want for the smart city to happen. It's called the acronym KIND CITY, which also uh, explains what we want to be. Uh, the acronym says knowledge and industry nexus destination. We want it to be the next destination after Bangalore. Most of the projects are infrastructure projects on transport, on smart town planning, security, education, water and sanitation, and uh, uh, various other smart infrastructure. I have a, a website I would urge all of you to log on to um, TSCL. This is Tumkur Smart City Limited dot Indian CST dot com. The entire operation of this $19 million from day to day, time to time, online is available on this um, uh, portal. Not only that, it is thanks to Nokia, uh, the mobile connectivity, we have 98% mobile penetration. So we have this on the mobile app as well. And we connect uh, through the app where we say citizen first. And we have 350 online public services. So you don't have to go to any public office uh, and then crib about uh, the accessibility issues. And you can just 
access it from your mobile, which you already possess. Or the other option is to go to the smart lounges, uh, which are available across the city, where the, there is somebody to facilitate uh, an interface between the government services and the citizen. We have uh, run several accolades on uh, smart lounges, where we again do inclusivity issues, where we call the people from slums, women, uneducated people, dropouts, uh, physically challenged and, and, and uh, mentally challenged also, and we ensure that di different gadgets are made available in the lounge, and they are made up to date to the various developments of the city. My managing director of the smart city has been voted as the most popular CEO of a smart city. Why? Because he took a small gadget like this and went to house to house and say, you have to pay your property tax, here is the calculation, please pay, and here is your receipt. So you don't have to run to uh, a, a public office. Uh, we have a collaboration with the uh, Tumkur University where we've opened something called a skill city. So apart from those who uh, don't get a degree or even get an opportunity to go to the school, we call them in the evening hours using the same premises of the university to provide them different skills which are under the Skill India program of Government of India. And that's how we are bringing these people into the mainstream. We are very shortly collaborating with Denmark as a sister city concept. We have these, uh, all my schools, government schools are today having smart classrooms. So all my Gen Next will be smart and I'm sure inclusive in their mindsets. Uh, we have um, the um, lab on bike. This is for introducing the scientific temper. So most people don't understand when you give them a science book, but when you make them explain the, through a model, uh, they understand it much better. So all that is in just one box. The entire laboratory is in a box. They open the box and they've got several experiments uh, to be played with. And this is where we are looking at you know, the, uh, the, the inclusivity of different sections of people through various uh, lounges. We've got a very important uh, uh, project called Digital Nerve Center. This is on the wellness side. So every person in the city has been mapped on the electronic health records. And sitting in one of those helpline centers, which are 24-7, run by the doctors, if you have any problem, you just have to press one panic button and you get the ambulance at your doorstep. You are while you're going, your x-rays and blood pressure and everything is taken. And by the time you reach, you have a table ready. Uh, you have the operations ready, you have the uh, doctor ready, and you have the um, uh, you know, surgery appointments. And end of it, everything is cashless because it is connected to the program of health insurance of government of India. Uh, WHO, interestingly, says 30% of our incomes go into health uh, and wellness treatment. So we are trying to save 30% of the incomes, and I want them to be seen in the higher income groups. Some of the ICT solutions that we have is a contro control and command center, which takes care of everything, safety, um, uh, traffic, and uh, health, and then uh, all, all kinds of things. And the um, emergency response system, intelligent uh, signaling, the transport thing that you mentioned, so everybody on the mobile can get to know when my bus is coming, it's late, or which, uh, which other bus can I take and how, and where is the bus shelter, and where is the nearest facility available. This is uh, how the intelligent transport system works. We have these, uh, the, I think this is one of my, my most favorite uh, uh, project called Digital Library. Uh, millions of journals across the world are available, ebooks are available. I urge each one of you to just log on to Tumkuru Digital Library and enjoy the books wherever you are. So we want our children sitting in the bus shelter or sitting in the bus or wherever they are, just go through the books, improve their knowledge and get moving in their life to come. Uh, this is the recent library week that we, uh, we just uh, celebrated. The incubation center. After the knowledge comes the incubation center. So I have all the facilities and tie-ups for the startups. And we want innovation to happen uh, totally free of cost. The entire infrastructure is being put up. Us. A very recent, uh, uh, re uh, on the urban governance side, we've got the drone. So now I have the 
uh, entire 80,000 properties of the city, having 3D mapping, and I know where the gaps are, where the drainage is broken, where the road is not tarred, where the open space is there, but it's all muddy, and so on and so forth. Um, this um, is one of the slum houses project that we've got. Uh, and, and Amsterdam was the inspiration for this, made it very colorful, so you can't call it slum dwellers, uh, this thing, and, and all of us would vie for getting one <laughs> slot over there. Uh, we've got uh, the transport network being modernized. We, these are some of our bus shelters with wi free Wi-Fi and all other uh, ICT uh, help across. This is another very interesting thing, all, all the flyovers that we have, the space underneath has been used for the vendors. So we've got about 8,000 vendors whom we have integrated through the map. So like the, um, the Uber, like the Swiggy, so you have these vendors coming up when in, a, in an integrated app, and people sitting there can order online. Um, this is about the energy efficient, so we want to be environment friendly. These are some of the beautiful smart parks for the public at large. And this is the most beautiful, the heart of the city, 500 acres of lake area, which is developed as a leisure place, totally uh, available for each and every one to rejuvenate. Finally, I would say that citizen engagement is the hallmark of all the smart city projects, and we are moving towards the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, which says no poverty, no hunger, gender inequity should go, climate, environment change should be tackled, and so on and so forth. I urge and take, make use of this platform to join hands with each one of you who would love to experiment, pilot, collaborate, and take things forward. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for that, that introduction. And what is really, uh, in one city, uh, a great example of how you can leverage technology, including mobile technology and connectivity, to support so many city services. Uh, really exciting. So our final speaker today will be, uh, and then we'll have some, some questions and discussion, will be Eunice Rendon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit uh, of something a little different. I, we have heard today a lot of inclusion. We heard about gender perspective, which is very important. We heard a lot about cities, especially the last one we heard. We heard about technology, telephones, everything today. But I think that one, one thing for in, in, in terms of inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable cities, as UN goal, 11 goal tell us, is very important to, to underline two, two things, safe and resilient cities. And also, as we heard at the, at the beginning with our first speaker, exclusion is not only in terms of gender. We have also uh, exclusion in terms of race, in terms of disability, in terms of different kinds or, or characteristics or of, or of traits of a person. So what we need is public policy that give access, uh, especially to populations that face holistic, uh, hostile situations, and they don't feel part of the economic and social development of their cities. And I've been working on that all my life. I've been former Vice Ministry of Violence Prevention. I worked for security a lot of time. I work with migrants. I work with all these populations. And uh, so I want to, to to point out also how can we use by, uh, technology in order to give access to those populations, but also to, to violence prevention strategies and how we can include communities through, in, through using technology and, how, and what can we do. So uh, in, in, on that perspective, I think that also uh, the inclusive cities has to, and the policies that for inclusion has to use this word, empathy. Because uh, as long as we have empathy in our policies, uh, we, we are going to be more effective. Higher empathy policy making pra practice leads, leads to better policies, which leads to better services, which leads to efficiency and cost savings, as well as happier people. 
a lot we more connected policies are, are useful for different things but especially with difficult populations or with population that have less less access to different uh, for example education social development economy and all those issues that we see a lot in Latin America and in other countries, we, it's very important to connect and to make these policies from grassroots. So uh, we, we have seen a lot of, of policies that look absolutely fine on paper, but can be an absolute disaster on implementation. So what we have be, uh, done or what I have done along my career is working with people. How can we do tailor-made policies and how can we use technology in order to do that? So for example, here we have, and I want to, to underline, for example, in Mexico, where, where I come, come from, is youngsters are very important because our first cause of death from 15 to 29 years are, is, is, is homicide. So we have to focus policies on that, on that perspective in this, in this in this population, uh, but it's not the same a youngster that have a very stable context that a youngster that had been in jail or a young, a young mother or a, a youngster in crime and violence problems or someone which is in, in all the risk factors in order to, 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 to commit crimes uh, and, and different uh, other kinds of, of, of youngsters. But if we have, uh, uh, if we can separate them and can do some different policies for, for different kind of people, we, we are going to have much more success. And I, I'm going to give you some examples because I don't have a lot of time. But I think that also inclusion and being part of a city is, is part, it, it means also to be part of the economy, to be part of the design, to be part of different things of the city. So what we, what we have done in different cities in, in Mexico is working with people as I told you, especially with people with problems with heroin, 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 addict to heroin, which are the, the little guys you, you can see there, with people in jail, with people in, in difficult communities. And we have developed uh, dif different, pol different strategies in, in terms of economic recovery, but all, uh, ev every time we use technology in order to know which their problems are and which their opportunities are also. So we can see these examples are, for example, this is a very dangerous, <laughs> dangerous neighborhood in Mexico, and we make a, like, a touristic uh, place to go, and all the people in the neighborhood are the ones that make all the touristic uh, experience and everything. But after that, what we have done in all these uh, strategies, this is, for example, a, deshydrat a deshydratated fruit factory in Apatzingan with widows of violence. We saw with, uh, with some technology uh, strategies and, and tools that we had a lot of widows in this part of Mexico because of violence. So we find out with this technology, these widows, and we we work with them, and now they have their own enterprise. We, we also train them through technology, but it was very difficult, all the, all the, um, all the story, but at the end, it, it works, and they feel included in the, in the strategy. For example, also, something very important is the multi-sectorial uh, work. This is, we, we work with a design, mode designer, very famous in New York, and we connect him with the people, with migrants, and also with people that had been in jail, and we make a little factory of, of, the, of, of clothes, and we present that our clothes, which is from a very specific neighborhood of Mexico, very well known as Tepito, and we present this brand in the fashion week of, in New York, and it's very famous, and we are selling a lot of these uh, clothes. And these are the women from the, from the neighborhood. They are the, the women that are from there. Cabrona means, uh, <laughs> bueno, cabrona means so, uh, uh, because in this neighborhood, women have to be cabrona because it's a very difficult one. And cabrona means someone that, has to be strong, has to help others, has to be really, really tough. No? And also, with technology, we can we, we use, by using the people in the communities like that, we, we, I show our, 
our people working there, but there were people of the community. So what we did is we used them to, to, to gather all the information of the community and we make an, uh, like a sort of, of community intelligence and it's like a big data, social big data. Uh, and with all this information, we have the maps that, that I show you that can, we can know where it is dangerous for people, where we have to do what, which, which are the opportunities and which are the problems also for the community. But something very important is to make a grassroots strategy. We also, for example, uh, uh, design this per person, Adrix Romero, because they, they contact uh, ways of contact of people, of youngsters over there was there, was Facebook in Acapulco. So we, we began to make this kind of, of gathering of information in different difficult neighborhoods. And uh, some, someone told us they are going to stall you the, the tablets. And what we did, it, we, we hired the people that were supposed to rob us. And it, that was very useful because they feel included and no one robs the, the, the technology from them. And also with, this, infor with this, this information in other neighborhoods, we have changed also the public space with people. So we designed that by digital strategies and including all the people in the neighborhood. No, not only one part, is even children have to participate. So we can see this is one of, of a very colorful neighborhood, but we did all with the community and we include the, the, the problem there is, was that we had two, gang, two, two pandillas, two gangsters, no? two gangsters that were in problems. So what we, we did a lot of peace process, but we also include all the community in order to change the space and to change the security over there. And now, and then we make a, a productive project, a social economy there. We make a museum in the streets, so everybody now go like a touristic way, you know? and I don't know if I have another. Bueno, but finally is, is, the, is that, you know? the idea is that we have to include people and uh, we have to, to have this inclusion with empathy and uh, regardless if we think uh, maybe people has been in problems, but we have to take them in account in order to change things. And technology is very useful to have a collective intelligence and gather it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and I think you, uh, you, you really end with a, a, um, a message and a term, empathy, that, that I think is a thread that goes across not, not just everyone on this panel, but even the, the keynote speakers from this morning. And I think uh, you're exactly right. That if we're going to, to identify and, and include these, these hidden groups, these hidden communities, um, we can leverage technology, we can leverage data and certainly innovation, but we need that empathy piece as well, which we've heard from, I think, all of you. So with that, I, we do have some time for, for questions for the panelists. Um, there's a microphone there. Uh, does anyone have, have some questions for a panelist or all of the panelists? Oh. Thanks very much. Uh, really interesting projects. Um, for the uh, smart city in India, um, I was just wondering, how do you decide which 10% uh, of the city to, to, to include in um, the sample? Um, and how do you manage that sense of, you know, those people are privileged um, because they get to do this first? Um, and if there are any other kind of issues that you came across. And then I was also interested in uh, with um, the project on mobility and care. How do you then adapt the transport systems to be um, more uh, supportive of people who are trying to fit all these different responsibilities in? And have you seen any examples of that actually happening? Thank you. Government of India has uh, framed guidelines wherein they want uh, the basically the CBD area, the center core of the city, to be developed into uh, this showcase. The reason being that you have more footfalls there. So the main market area, the, all the departments, uh, public offices, everything is there, the railway station and so on. So that is the 10%, but the footfalls are 
it's that area which gets taken as the uh, uh, priority area. Yeah. Well, you need to um, for uh, to, to be able to have transport systems that are better responsive to the needs of, of daily life of men and women and to the requirements of care activities, you need um, to better integrate planning and transport, both in planning and management of cities and the building of transportation systems and their management. Uh, and, uh, and there needs to be a shift in priorities from focusing on private, um, uh, 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 pri private transportation means to better, uh, to a um, bigger focus in public transportation, um, to supporting pedestrian uh, trips in the in a closer environment of the home and also of workplaces, in which a different, a proper mix of uh, of activities take place. If you need to 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 move for. Uh, 20, 30, or 40 minutes to do something that you need to do on a daily basis before or after going to work, and this is an additional trip, as is the case in a study I did in Nairobi, in Kenya, uh, that women had to do one uh, more additional trip than men for care purposes, and this ad additional trip was as long as the trips that they were done on a daily basis for employment purposes. 30 or 40 minutes trip uh, for, uh, for something that is uh, needed for daily life, something that in our cities is around the corner, like the, child, like the kids' school or, or things that have to do with buying medicines, whatever you need on a daily basis. So you need to have, and this is why it's so important to integrate planning and transportation. And you need to have the activities uh, and the buildings where the activities needed for supporting daily life, they need to be close and integrated with housing neighborhoods and also uh, uh, close to employment centers where, uh, where employment concentration implies that people go there every, on a daily basis as well. So you need this combination. Um, and, and then you need also uh, to put greater emphasis on um, public uh, collective means of transportation and pedestrian move. For instance, cities that are based on car use, like a city uh, uh, like Los Angeles, for instance, you cannot go anywhere without a car in Los Angeles, practically, for everyday needs. Uh, so, um, for instance, you could do, and I know that the Los Angeles Transportation uh, Department is working to improve um, this mix of uses, the, the, the accessibility needs uh, of kids and, and, and mothers and, and fathers when they also take care of that by creating, by Im improving the quality of public space. Because roads are not just for cars, they are for people too. And if you cannot walk because there's no sidewalk and it's not safe, then uh, you, people cannot move autonomously. Uh, and so, and creating nodes with a certain uh, mixity and density of use and, and diversity of activities related with public transportation. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we, we don't have time for another, question, another question, but before we end, okay. I think Dr. Rajneesh would like to, uh, yeah. to yeah. Uh, have the floor for a minute. I, I just want, uh, for the sake of inclusivity, my colleagues uh, from other smart cities, uh, Charu, Charulata, Hepsheba, Ajay, please come, and I want uh, you to be felicitating our panelists, and we look forward to stronger relationships. Please come. Please come. The... Um, Scarf that we have is an Indian uh, uh, woven uh, stuff. Present it to the last person. Last person there. Yeah, put it around the neck. It's, you give it, we'll give it. Marvelous. Thank you You give this to him. Give it to the lady. Yeah, I've got something nutritious for you. Thank you. We'll have a group picture. If you don't mind, we'll have a group Thank picture. You. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Very, very Thank you. We'll have a group picture. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. With that, I think we're finished. Um, yep. Thank you so much for yeah, joining us much. and for your, your questions and for the dialogue. And thank you to our panelists and our two keynote yes. speakers. I will thank give you. my noise. <laughs> it's like that.